Well, look, um, I'd like to welcome you here to the talk tonight on the history of the US interstate system. I'm, I'm sure you'll find it an interesting talk. Uh, my name is Paul McDonald. I'm actually a civil engineer, highway engineer. Uh, probably goes uh, quite, quite, follows quite naturally that I will be doing a talk on the history of the US interstate system. And it follows on from the talk I did last year for the local government division on the history of the European motorway system, which is still available on the, uh, the podcast on the Engineers Ireland website. But uh, just in terms of the US interstate system, uh, it, it was obviously uh, um, it was uh, probably the largest civil engineering project in the world uh, with, with the objective of delivering a transcontinental uh, efficient uh, motor vehicle transport across the, the US. And it was, it, was, it was driven by political and economic factors in terms of the post-war period, in terms of demands for uh, greater economic development. But uh, also there was a kind of an implicit, uh, not just a civilian use, but an implicit military use in the interstate system. And it was no coincidence, coincidence that the, the 1956 uh, Interstate Act was called the Federal Highways Act uh, and National Defence Act. So um, there was an implicit military use in terms of um, an efficient road transport system for moving troops either to the east coast or the west coast, which would have been important in the context of the Cold War. And also um, a, a much a less noted factor was the role it may have played for evacuating cities uh, in the event of, of uh, an all-out war between the US and the Soviet Union in the Cold War. So, so not only a civilian use for the, the, the interstates, but there was an implicit military use as well. So just setting the context. Uh, why did I do uh, a talk on the interstate system? Well, there's an, an intricate link between the US the development of the US interstate system and the development of the motorways in system in Western Europe, which I covered in my previous talk. And um, uh, the, the US interstate system in terms of design and construction standards would have would have influenced the development of the Euro European motorways and vice versa but um, and even the motorways here in Ireland uh, the NACE bypass upgrade which I was just talking about there that was originally Ireland's first motorway and Dick Burke the late Dick Burke he, he passed away there recently he worked on the design of I-95 in the interstate system in the US in the 1960s and he brought back much of the, des the geometric design standards from the US to use uh, in the design of the M7 NACE bypass which was Ireland's first motorway so there was a direct influence even on Ireland's motor first motorway in terms of the US interstate system but uh, just in terms of the 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 the, the, the history of the the pre-interstate systems well a few notable points the I70 interstate 70 or what what is now interstate 70 in Pennsylvania uh, th that turnpike road was probably the first high speed highway in the, the, the US, uh, built in the early 1940s. Also the I-78, um, Interstate 78, the Holland Tunnel in New York, that was built in 1928. And the I-495, the Queens to Manhattan Tunnel, again in New York, indicated the developing, or th probably the more experimental uh, you, um, design of high-speed uh, r uh, roads and also um, tunnel design and construction. Also, Michigan State Department, uh, they experimented with T-beams and bridges, although not on a widespread basis in the 1920s. And then, uh, so all these things, I suppose, were the kind of the embryonic start of the design and construction standards, which would, which would eventually be brought to full fruition in the interstate program from the 1950s and 60s onwards. Although it's interesting to note, some of the older construction methods in the pre-war era, like uh, the use of shallow tr truss decks for bridges and also riveted plate girders for bridges, uh, they, they, f they, they um, they tend to they probably fell out of favor in the in w when the interstates were being constructed as they were found to be uh, limiting in terms of uh, buildability and also even design standards etc but that just sets the context in terms of um, some of the, the the design and construction methodologies that they were using before in the pre-war era and uh, but some of which obviously would go on to influence the development of the interstates so why did the interstates happen well you can see um Dwight D. Eisenhower here. He was actually the commander of the Allied forces in Europe. This, these are, this is the Americans on the German uh, autobahn system in 1945. And when Eisenhower saw the German autobahn system, it had a huge impact on him in terms of um, uh, his thinking and in terms of the future transport development in America. He, he saw the German uh, Autobahn system and decided that uh, the Americans had to replicate the system in uh, the United States. So when he went to, 
when he went on to become president in the 50s, he brought in the 1956 Federal Highways and National Defence Act, or Interstate Act, as I've just summed it up there. So that was the real, um, the, the, the driving force uh, in terms of the kind of the, the, the creation of the interstate system. Uh, some of the key teams of this talk, well, um, the, the things that link all the interstate projects are the things like the construction risks associated with the interstates, the, the, the geography of the United States, the mountain ranges of, in terms of the Rocky Mountains, Sierra Nevada, and the Appalachian Mountains in the east, and also the Colorado Plateau Canyons. They, these were significant geographic challenges that the interstates had to negotiate. Also, the soft river delta areas of the Mississippi River in the south, that, that would have to be uh, uh, addressed in terms of engineering solutions. And also the large urban areas in terms of the cities on the east coast and the west coast as well, and ensuring um, uh, uh, minimizing political objection against routing of the interstates, that was a challenge as well. So these were all construction risks. So the second team is engineering innovation, um, and this was, would have been the kind of the innovative design and construction standards that the that the the interstate engineers used to address these construction risks. And the third team, which I'm going to just cover, which links all the the interstate projects, is the the relationship between engineering and society, and how one influenced the other. And I'll, I'll come back to that. Sorry. I don't know why that happened. Uh, just starting on the East Coast, um, you've got Interstate 95. Um, th this was a key corridor which had to be developed, uh, running from Maine, Massachusetts in the north, the whole way down to New York and down to uh, Florida and Miami. There were 70 million people living on the East Coast in 1960, so it was a, it was a key um, economic corridor and it, it accounted for one third of all jobs and activity in the United States. So uh, the development of Interstate 95 in the post-war era w was, was a key requirement. And uh, the Baltimore to Philadelphia section between Washington and New York was, it, was, it, was a key uh, section of Interstate 95. It was developed in the early 60s in nearly record time in about two and a half years. And um, it, it, it incorporated the, 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 the thinking in terms of design standards of, of motorways in America and in Europe in the post-war era, very broad curves, minimum curves of 700 mil meter um, radius, also um, maximum gradients of 4% um, uh, and also the use of wide medians for safety uh, in the event of a car losing control and also in terms of future upgrade of um, the motorway. So that, that, so that was the Baltimore to Philadelphia section. That was actually the opening of the Baltimore to Philadelphia section. You can see John F. Kennedy. It was actually about a week before he died, so it's a kind of quite a poignant photo. But um, uh, the point uh, I, I'm going to make here is that it, it sh just showed how um, how the, the political influences and factors which were driving the development of the interstates in terms of economic and social development. Uh, just further north along Interstate 95 at Philadelphia, um, there was an objection to the original elevated um, road proposal for Interstate 95 through Philadelphia, uh, just near the harbour area, uh, by a coalition of planners and architects. And then uh, the engineers uh, adjusted the, uh, the proposal and they went with an ad grade um, proposal, uh, ground level, for the Interstate 95. Uh, the problem was uh, much of the ground in the harbour at, at in Philadelphia at an area called Penn's Landing um, was soft, so it required piling. But there was there was also the presence of the city, um, the main water supply for the city, and also the sewer outfall for the city, which had contaminated much of the ground. So the danger with the piling was that uh, the disturbance of the contaminated ground would would contaminate. Uh, the, the water supply outfall, which had to be avoided at all costs. So they, they, they used the innovation of these hollow cylindrical tubes, which were driven into the ground. All the material was extracted from the tubes, and then the piles were then driven into the empty tubes. I suppose the, the, the innovation here was, was that it meant that um, uh, driving the piles within the cylindrical tubes meant that there was going to be no stresses being imposed on the ground which, which may have caused disturbance and, and possible contamination of the water supply. And then that's just a photo there of Interstate 95 at Penn's Landing. Site of the original, uh, uh, the landing point of much of the original European immigrants to um, America. But it was, it was still controversial because it split much of the Penn's Landing area. And now they're even looking at a proposal to uh, put uh, Interstate 95 underground here. And that's just in the modern context, although this hasn't happened to date. Just another interesting feature in terms of innovation on Interstate 95, built in the 1980s, was Fort McHenry Tunnel in Baltimore Harbor. 
Yeah, this tunnel uh, was uh, was replaced or uh, upgraded, augmented the original um, uh, tunnel uh, uh, under the harbour built in the 1950s. Its innovation was that um, it, it made use of this high quality lighting and, and also a, 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 a white painted surface to avoid the dark tunnel effect for cars going into the tunnel, which could have caused sudden braking movements uh, if drivers perceive that they can't see clearly ahead. So the lighting and the, the, white, the, white, pave, the white painted pavement uh, um, uh, mitigated this dark tunnel effect and drivers could maintain high speed. Also in terms of the geometric alignment, the, the tunnel changed not only in the vertical but also in the horizontal as a uh, uh, alignment as well so it's quite complex in terms of a changing horizontal and vertical alignment uh, uh, um, in terms of the 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 tunnel construction it was an immersed tunnel uh, construction type and obviously this, this is one of the uh, units which was constructed uh, near the harbor and then sailed into place and sunk in place and then that's just a picture of Fort McHenry tunnel today it handles over 120,000 um, vehicles per day and you can just see the old tunnel right beside the new tunnel there. So that's Fort McHenry Tunnel. Just some last few in interesting points about Interstate 95. The, um, just in terms of, I mentioned previously about the use of um, riveted plate girders for bridges. Well, these were largely replaced by continuous steel beam bridges in the post-war area because in terms of buildability and uh, speed. And uh, that's the, the Robert Prose Memorial Bridge on Interstate 95 utilised these kind of steel beams in the post-war era. And then also in environmental terms, this Fraconian uh, Notch Park in New Hampshire, they reduced the cross-section to two lanes because they didn't want to avoid a, a, a large environmental impact on the park. So you see here Interstate 95 is actually reduced to, to two lanes uh, through the park. That's, that, that would be north of Boston. Massachusetts and obviously it indicates how environmental protection influenced the, the road uh, cross-sectional features. And then just to recap, there's Interstate 95 running up the Atlantic coast there. Uh, just uh, um, uh, in terms of uh, another key north-south route was Interstate 75 running from uh, Michigan the whole way down to Florida. It runs the other side of the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, Interstate 95 is uh, east of the Appalachian Mountains. The challenge for Interstate 95 was linking it in at Miami. The residents objected to the interstate, uh, um, uh, interstate uh, interchange being located near the city. So uh, the, uh, the, the, the route was located further north. And the challenge with um, Florida was that uh, Florida is obviously a peninsula, so there's very little options in terms of route locations. So um, uh, they, they had to actually locate the, uh, the alternative route through a, 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 an environmental park known as Alligator Alley. And um, uh, the, the, uh, I suppose in terms of the environmental features that had to be incorporated, uh, water underpasses to allow the water flow under the uh, interstate, and also animal passes to allow maybe things like alligators and snakes, etc., to pass and under the interstate, uh, um, uh, interstate 75. So it just indicates actually the engineers when they were designing the interstates, they took on board uh, um, uh, the, the, the public opinion and environmentalists' opinion in terms of uh, integrating environmental protection features. And it's actually a team across all of America that anywhere any environmental area was being threatened by an interstate, the public usually had a very strong opinion about. Uh, so just further north on Interstate 75, uh, the, you've got the Mackinac Bridge, which connects the two peninsulas of uh, Michigan State. So this was uh, uh, reflected the kind of the innovation in terms of bridge construction in, in the post in, as part of the interstate program, uh, moving away from the plate girder bridges towards these um, uh, deep, um, deep stiffened truss bridges with, with very high slender uh, towers. Uh, that's obviously in a, s a suspension bridge. It was about uh, eight kilometers long. So it was the longest suspension bridge in the US at the time. And um, also, it was the fourth longest suspension bridge in uh, the world. The key challenge here, here were wind uh, and also very cold temperatures in the in in the in the area. So uh, the bridge had a certain tolerance, allowing movement during the, the uh, windy uh, periods, and obviously that was incorporated into the to the design and construction of the bridges. And 
Just in terms of Interstate 95, uh, 75, just uh, some uh, two, two points is that there was more extensive use of T-beams in the Interstate program, where previously they had experimented with T-beams in the 1920s, now they were be being used on, on a large-scale basis, and also uh, uh, um, bridges with high-level clearances for shipping to pass under. This was a feature of a lot of the bridge construction in, uh, on the interstate system. Uh, and also in the south as well, um, where the petrochemical industry was been developed on the Gulf states, m many of the bridges had to develop very high clearances in the order of maybe 35 to 40 metre clearances to allow ships to pass under them, uh, uh, thereby avoiding the need for cars to be delayed at uh, these, um, these um, um, mo moving bridges. So anyway, um, just looking at the key east-west interstates, uh, Interstate 10 running along here, along the Gulf Coast, uh, over through Texas and over to California, that was a key east-west link in the interstate system. Uh, just along the Gulf Coast, uh, the, in Louisiana, you've got the Atchafalaya Bridge, uh, River and Swamp, which is just west of the Mississippi River and uh, uh, Delta. What were the technical risks? Well, obviously, the swamp ground uh, it was a, a geotechnical challenge, and the challenge was to build a 26-kilometer 26, uh, 26 kilometer bridge through the Atchafalaya Swamp. So the, the construction company which did this was a, a, a company called Bow Brothers Construction, and they were experts in uh, piling. They were probably the best piling contractor in the south of uh, the US. So they, they drove, um, I think it was something of the order of 8,000 piles in the, into the delta. And then the precast units were actually sailed up through the network of, of canals in the delta, and then they were lifted into place on top of the, uh, the piles. And uh, that obviously uh, enabled um, uh, um, efficient access through what was would have been a previously very challenging um, um, uh, area to negotiate. And that's just a picture of the Atchafalaya Bridge. You can see just the piles there, just stretching off way off into the distance. And obviously, um, environmental protection would have been a, a concern here when the bridge was built and opened in 1973. But obviously, the engineers took that on board. Further west on Interstate 10, there was actually opportunities opened up in terms of the design of Interstate 10, uh, because in uh, wh when you go further east on or further west on Interstate 10, the uh, the population density of 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 states like uh, like Texas is very low. Uh, most of the land was used for cattle ranching, so there was very low population. So the, 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 the engineers felt that there was no need to put in great separated junctions, such was the low level of traffic on this section of Interstate 10. So you can see the at-grade junctions were, were, were put in place because such was the low uh, volumes of traffic that the, the, the probability of accidents was extremely low. So it was viewed as an opportunity to save costs on the uh, Interstate 10 at that location. Now, Interstate 70, uh, we were just talking about uh, Colorado there, but um, this is probably, I'd say, probably the engineering highlight of the interstate system, uh, because uh, along Interstate 70, uh, key east-west route in Colorado, and then out down onto Interstate 15, you probably have three of the top five engineering highlights of the interstate system. So it's, it's, it, it probably is the jewel in the crown in terms of the, the engineering of the interstate system. Um, <coughs> The, the, the challenge in Colorado in terms of uh, Interstate 70 was the Rocky Mountains, and uh, uh, the Rocky Mountains effectively divided Colorado in, in winter time, and, and, and car transport between eastern and western Colorado was nearly impossible due to the, 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 the poor conditions in the, color in the Rocky Mountains. So the solution was a twin bore tunnel. Which would, which would pass through um, the, the summit of the, the Rocky Mountains. It was um, 2.5 kilometers long, the longest tunnel uh, um, in, the, in the world at the time, and also was the highest because it was built at an elevation of 11,000 feet above sea level. So the, the eastbound bore was uh, initially a pilot bore, basically a horizontal borehole from which geological data would be gained for construction of the westbound bore. And um, the, what were the technical risks? Well, well, nearly everything, uh, everything that could go wrong um, did go wrong. Uh, when, they, when they started constructing the, the oak for the tunnel, which was about 15 metres high by 45 metres uh, wide, uh, they excavated half a million tonnes of rock. Unfortunately, the rock face kept collapsing, so nearly 200,000 cubic metres of concrete had to be installed to, to literally hold up the rock face. Also, there was huge water flow from the rock, about 300 gallons per minute, 
and obviously uh, a drainage system was installed to cope with 500 gallons per minute in terms of uh, water flow from the 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 the, the tunnel uh, from the rock face and also um, and there was there was, uh, there was a challenge in terms of uh, emissions at that uh, height because emissions go up the higher up you go in terms of elevation so they they, they used empirical data in terms of actual uh, raw test test data they got f they drove 40 vehicles up and down um, either the part of the the, the cut out tunnel or, or a similar um, a, a similar uh, kind of uh, at a similar height and they worked out that they would need 1.6 cubic 1.6 million cubic feet of air every minute to keep the tunnel ventilated and then obviously uh, those uh, ventilation systems were incorporated within the, uh, the administration buildings at the uh, at the eastern face and also the western face of the tunnel so the eastbound tunnel opened in 1973 which was the uh, and then the westbound tunnel opened in 1979 um, just uh, an interesting note at the, at the staffing level in terms of the Eisenhower Tunnel. The state, Colorado State Engineer was a, was a, a gentleman called Charles uh, Shoemate, and he had no qualification whatsoever. He started out as a chain man and worked his way up to being state engineer. And instead of the Colorado um, state authorities putting him to the trouble of going to get his engineering degree, they just ch they changed the state laws to allow him to become state engineer with no qualification. I'm sure he must have been a very good engineer for them to go that far. But um, it was just uh, at the end of the, the, the job, he was quoted as saying, I'm retiring now. Uh, you can only do one project like that in a lifetime. <laughs> so the, the another interesting uh, um, uh, comment about uh, the staffing on this job. There was one of the first female uh, interstate engineers, whose name eludes me at the minute, uh, requested to work on the tunnel, and there was a kind of a superstition thing about no female engineers being allowed in the tunnel. So there was gr great objections to the, the, her request to work in the tunnel. Uh, uh, she finally took a legal action against the Colorado State Highway Commission, and eventually, Mr. Charles Schumacher, the, the man without the, the engineering degree, he eventually relented and allowed her to go work in, in the tunnel. Uh, so it, I suppose it, it, it nicely illustrates the kind of engineering and society theme, I think, in terms of changing roles, particularly in terms of women being involved in the engineering profession. And I suppose uh, these projects like this maybe facilitated that transition. Uh, just further west on Interstate 70 is Glenwood Canyon. Uh, the challenge here was was basically to try and build uh, the interstates within a 150 meter wide canyon, a vertical face canyon with a river at the bottom of it. So it was it was near mission impossible in engineering terms. So they went. Uh, they had two French engineers working on on the the, the design of the the project, and they went for this uh, elevated viaducts on uh, for for running it's, it's a, the opposing bound carriageway. One was essentially run over the other on the on on the slender columns. So it was an elevated viaduct, and uh, it was constructed. The consortium who built it was was led by a construction company called uh, Kiwit Construction. And they had a lot of experience in canal construction and dam construction in California in the in the pre-war period. So the, they had to divert the Colorado River uh, something 12 or 13 times to enable construction of the Interstate 70. And some of the interesting features of, of obviously the construction of the, the viaduct was obviously uh, uh, construction of, a, uh, of an embankment was not was not an option here in, in environmental terms because the Sierra Club and the Colorado Open Spaces Club, two environmentalist groups, they objected to the construction of Interstate 70 in Glenwood Canyon. So this elevated viaduct would obviously replace an, um, uh, an embankment, a standard typical embankment. Also in terms of cuttings to avoid impacting the rock face, uh, vertical walls were used to, to retain any cut areas uh, to, 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 to ensure minimal impact on the, uh, the, the landscape. And also there was a, a proviso on the engineers to have anywhere where trees were impacted, they had to be immediately replanted. Uh, so and any, anywhere where, where there was an impact in terms of c cuttings, uh, the, the native species were, were, were replanted there. So it, I suppose really it worked very well in terms of integrating a road into a very sensitive landscape and, and really making it work. So that, that, that was the uh, Glenwood Canyon scheme. And then further west along uh, Interstate 70 into Utah, you had the Green River Valley. So this was obviously another sensitive um, uh, 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 gorge canyon area. And uh, uh, such, such was the, the concern about uh, the impact. They initially only built a single carriageway road for I-70 through Green River Valley. 
uh, much like the, the previous example, which I, I mentioned about uh, Interstate 95 in New Hampshire, uh, but it still required the excavation of 3.5 million cubic tons of material. And in 1990, they eventually upgraded the road to a dual carriageway. So it was, it was another um, engineering highlight of Interstate 70. And then the last of the four is uh, Interstate 70 ends at Interstate 15, not far, uh, in Utah. And then um, uh, Interstate 15 is a key north-south link from, from the Midlands, or from, from the Midwest, down to the Pacific Coast. Uh, again, uh, very similar to the Glenwood Canyon uh, uh, scheme, the, the, the river at, at the bottom of uh, Virgin River Valley had to be diverted 12 times, again by Keywood construction. Uh, again, these viaduct bridges were used for areas of fill, and retaining walls were used to reduce the, the land take area in terms of uh, reducing uh, 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 cuts, um, cut slopes. And also, they adopted this natural rock cuttings where, where cuttings did, did take place. So that was a uh, river valley uh, in Arizona, which was opened in the 1973, and that's a picture of river valley today. The I think the Arizona um, the Ar Arizona Highway Commission magazine or a similar uh, well-known publication uh, noted that it was it was a scheme which actually uh, int which actually enhanced the natural beauty of Virgin River Valley as opposed to detracting from from it which was obviously uh, complementary in terms of the the work of the engineers then just as uh, summing up some of the other key east west interstate routes Interest in the Midwest, Interstate 80 in Nebraska uh, was 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 uh, an important route in terms of uh, heritage protection. It was running quite close to the original Pioneer Trails from east to west, which would have been used in the 19th century. So they actually acquired extra land for the road cross section and moved the road slightly to avoid some of these uh, the original um, tracks of the heritage, the Pioneer Heritage Trails, which are an, an important heritage feature. So again balancing uh, the, the construction of a, of a high-speed uh, uh, interstate with the preservation of, of the heritage of the area. And then uh, similarly, Interstate 80 further west at Donner Pass through the Sierra Nevada Mountains. This was obviously very challenging topography to, to for the interstate to negotiate, but, but uh, the the the, in, the interstate 80 w was designed to meet modern the modern geometric standards of the interstate system whilst negotiating a very challenging topography of the Sierra Nevada mountains and uh, such was the uh, the work of the engineers that the Associ American Association of Civil uh, Society for Civil uh, Engineers gave it the 1964 uh, uh, achievement for um, engineering achievement of the year award in terms of the engineering design whilst integrating that design into the, uh, the challenging topography of the Sierra Nevada mountains. And that's a picture of the Donner Pass today, Interstate 80. Winter maintenance is obviously very important to maintain the road and maintain its access during the winter uh, periods. Then similarly, uh, this Snoqualmie Pass on Interstate 90 in Washington, again, winter maintenance is a very important issue to maintain access during the, uh, the winter period. It was also not, um, uh, not, uh, noteworthy, this, uh, this uh, section of interstate construction, for the use of, eleva again, elevated sections of, uh, of, of roadway to avoid any environmental impact on any of the, the, the environmental areas, and also because of the issue of earthquakes in in the in the the west coast region of america uh, they had they had hollow box um the hollow concrete box units in the construction of the the v, the elevated viaduct sections and within these th th you had a um, access for the engineers the maintenance engineers to the bearings and also um f to the seismic movement uh, units so which obviously allowed a certain amount of movement in an earthquake but there were obviously hollow box to enable the maintenance engineers to access the and um, reset obviously this the seismic movement units in the event of tremors etc so it, it just shows the innovation and also the the steel on some of the the structures was allowed to weather naturally so it, it blended in with the background of the 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 environmental area of it which is really it's probably the northernmost end of the rocky mountains in washington state and then we're kind of coming to, to the end now uh, just finishing up with the west coast interstate 95 or sorry interstate 5 was a key north south route in california and also, society was influencing the development of the interstates, and uh, particularly the, new, the, the Sun Belt states, California, New Mexico, Arizona, and Nevada. There was a westward movement of people to these states in the post-war period, uh, also, partic 
but also because of development in under engineering areas like ventilation technology it meant that you could have ventilation shopping malls and factories and there was a big movement of people to the Sun Belt states for lifestyle reasons so and there was a lot of new industries developed in the Sun Belt state in the 1960s including the aerospace industry the electronics industry and the defense industry so these drove the demand for year-round access through the Rocky Mountains so what was happening broadly more broadly in, in, in terms of science technology in American society influenced the development of the interstates in terms of year-round access through the Rocky Mountains which really was uh, critical for the development of these these industries and year-round access really across uh, America so Interstate, nine, uh, Interstate 5 was obviously uh, um, developed and obviously it's a um, concrete road service, uh, typical of much of the concrete pavements which were used in the interstate system, Sl uh, slip form concrete construction which, uh, which also influenced the development of roads in Europe. The Belgians sent over a uh, a knowledge sharing team to America to witness the construction of slip form concrete roads and the Belgians replicated that in Belgium. And also uh, here in Ireland, the first dual carriageway in Ireland, Dublin Nace Road built in the 50s and 60s, that was actually concrete construction as well and I would confidently say that that was probably influenced probably by the, the American interstate technology or it was influenced or the British adopted the American uh, concrete slip form construction and then maybe we copied the British, you know. But it just goes to show you the knowledge sharing team. So obviously these interstates were very welcome in expanding states like California. But they weren't uh, quite welcome further north in cities like Se Seattle, m older, more sedate communities. You can see the protests uh, associated with the development of Interstate 5 at Seattle. What was the challenge? Well, on the west of Seattle, you had mountains and you had uh, an estuary, uh, the Pacific Estuary. And on the east of S Seattle, you had more mountains and you had a huge lake. So really, the only way to go through Seattle was uh, right through the middle of it. So that's, that's the way they, they went through Seattle. They, they just really came straight through the middle of it. And the, the challenge was obviously they cut off residential communities from the, the business district. So it was quite controversial. And um, uh, it's, it's although the engineers were able to develop Interstate 5 through Seattle, that was the last one that they, they developed. After that, there was a lot of legal challenges against any interstate development, s some of which some, uh, some uh, more lesser known interstates had to be abandoned midway during construction because of the controversy associated with their development and also the, the very strong legal challenges which were being brought against interstates and so there was obviously uh, there was a, a pro uh, there was a kind of a, a pro and anti lobbies regarding the interstate construction and there, there were I suppose they were, they were viewed as quite controversial with some people although over the years you can see the way uh, w with uh, Interstate 5 in Seattle has maybe been integrated through you know the features which have been put in they also installed a five acre uh, cap over the interstate essentially they built a roof over the interstate and they put parks etc in it and that I suppose maybe uh, mitigated uh, the 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 kind of the divisive effect that maybe Interstate 5 had had through Seattle so I suppose maybe people have come in Seattle to appreciate the benefits of the interstate whilst also uh, being able to have uh, proper community access etc. So just in conclusion the uh, US interstate system was the largest civil engineering project in the world um, it was initially estimated at 25 billion but cost uh, up towards 120 billion uh, by the, the finish of its construction. It coincided with a, a huge growth in the US economy driving that growth but also and been, but obviously also been influenced by economic factors in terms of uh, uh, facilitating access for trade and commerce. Uh, the criticisms of the interstate, well, the, the blending of America. Uh, one one uh, writer said he, you could drive from the East Coast to the West Coast on an interstate without seeing a single thing. So that was the criticisms associated with the interstate. But obviously that's the, the trade-off that you, 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 you pay in terms of a high-speed limited access motorway. The lessons learned, well, environmental features were incorporated uh, all throughout the interstate system. The engineers listened to the environmentalists and they, 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 and they, they incorporated features within the interstate schemes. The innovations, well, tunnels, viaducts, continuous steel deck bridges, uh, the deep, uh, deep stiffened truss bridges and slender towers, these were all the innovations which were utilised in, in the interstate construction during the 60s and 70s. And also in terms of, they took on board public opinion. They, they, they tended to avoid interstate um, uh, terminals or junctions within city areas and where they did have these such as um, the, the Bronx Expressway in New York 
They tended to have um, plenty of pedestrian walkways and they also tended to avoid placing the interstate right beside houses. They usually located them beside either parks or shopping malls where they were near cities like New York. Uh, they avoided putting them right beside residential houses because obviously the noise effect. And then obviously um, any environmental parks, the public tended to come out uh, and, and uh, ask plenty of questions and, and ensure that there was no impact on any of the environmental parks, etc. So just uh, I'm going to finish up with a few slides in terms of openings. That's the, inter that's the Virgin River Valley, uh, which I just mentioned previously in Arizona. Uh, that's the opening in 1973. That's actually the opening of the Mackinac Bridge in 1958 and they, to celebrate the occasion they had 58 beauty queens in the cars coming across the bridge. So um, uh, an all-American affair opening the Mackinac Bridge. Uh, that's actually the Interstate 35 opening in Texas. Uh, they were cutting the human chain uh, and that's the cutting the human ribbon. And then Interstate 5 opening, which I just previously mentioned, this was actually an international occasion because Interstate 5 was linking from Canada through Washington, Oregon, California, down into Mexico. So it actually you had representatives from all three countries, Canada, the US, and Mexico. And you can see the flags. You have the Canadian flag, you have the American flag, and you have the Mexican flag there. So it was viewed as an international occasion that Interstate 5 within the US would be would open up trade and commerce more generally within North America. So it's an interesting example of this. And my final slide is the opening of Interstate 29 in Missouri. I'll just leave you with that one. So anyway, only in America. <laughs> anyway, look, I'd like to thank you for your time and attention. Does, does anybody, and I, I've, I've kept it to uh, 40 minutes, which is what I wanted to do. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, Gentlemen? Uh, all, um, yeah. I have to say, it's, it's a very impressive uh, presentation. Yeah. And I think what struck me about it was particularly uh, the, um, the highways going through the Rockies and, and that, that mm. environmental um, uh, uh, impact was minimized. Yeah. And clearly, um, the, the, the engineers and, and the proposers were, were clearly listening to the, to the, um, the, the things. Population. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, you know, it, it would appear, although it, it did take a long time to, to cover the states with the highways, um, it, it, it was rapid enough. Can you consider our progress? Oh, yeah. Push through. Yeah. Uh, and and, and, and the, I suppose it's purposefully really, isn't it, to try to get a, a road through, through uh, the planning process? Oh, it, it is, yeah. Uh, I know, yeah. I mean, really, I've told friends of mine when I'm talking to them in the pub, I said, about 80%. Uh, the, the construction of the road is the last 20%. The other 80% is the planning, the approvals, the design, the consultations. And the, my friend said to me, I thought you just go out with the diggers and start digging. I said, no. I said, that's the last, that's the easy bit. That's the last 15% of the road scheme, yeah. So um, I suppose, I, I often kind of like to think that um, th these, are, these are the trials and tribulations of, of doing engineering in, in, in a kind of a democratic society, that you have to take the public consultation, and rightly so, you have to take the public's opinion on board, you have to take the view of environmental groups on board. I think the benefit for us as engineers is it makes us think twice and, and maybe the more easier solution of building, a, you know, and cheaper solution of building an embankment through maybe a sensitive environmental area or a, a cutting through, um, a, a cutting through, um, you know, um, a sensitive environmental area. We, we, it makes us rethink and it makes us think about solutions like maybe tunnels or maybe elevated viaducts which have less of an impact and in many cases they, 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 they're designed in such a way particularly and I, I also covered this in my talk on Western Europe particularly if the, you, you use very sweeping uh, horizontal curves and gentle gradients you, you can really make them to, to, to really integrate within the landscape itself so I suppose that was really the achievement that, that the, the, the interest that the engineers on the interstate, uh, uh, by taking on board the views of environmental groups and the political protest groups, that, that I think they, they arrived at the best uh, solution. But uh, I, I suppose it's the challenge we face as, as, as civil roads engineers in, in, in states, in, in countries where we have to consult the public. Rightly so, I would add, because um, I was at the last year's local government conference as uh, the former 
Cavan County Manager Jack Keyes, who I, I worked in under, he said, he said, uh, we're building the roads or the water mains or the houses for these communities, a lot of these communities themselves. So it's only proper that they have a say in the way it's, because when we move on or we're gone or we're gone on to the next job, they're the ones who are looking at them for the next, you know, 50 years or, or using them for the next 50 years. And uh, I think there's, um, there's a lot of knowledge that can be gained. There's a inter very interesting case of the construction of one of the more minor interstates in New York City, in one of the, the, the foothills, uh, the, through the Appalachian Mountains. And actually, um, the, the engineers built the, the pier uh, in, within a stream, right in the center of the stream. But obviously the high elevation in the mountains and the, the melting snow, at certain times of the years, there was huge flows from the melting snows. And unfortunately, the pier was put right in the middle of the the stream, so this stream turned into a, a kind of a, kind of a, a, a tsunami at certain times of the year, and basically it washed the pier out of it. The whole bridge collapsed, and uh, I suppose the point. I suppose uh, what I took away from it is that the engineers probably should have consulted the po asked for about the local knowledge. You know, we're, this is our proposal. Probably the f the first re the first local who came into a public consultation would point out, say, you do know that tur that turns into a, a tsunami during December and January. So it was a very interesting thing of of maybe where the, where the public hadn't been consulted, and it was to the disadvantage to everybody, the engineers and the community, that they hadn't been consulted on the matter. Any other questions? Yeah. Just a few notes. Yeah, great. From, uh, my time Your time, great. In the US. Well done. Yeah. Very brief. Yeah, great. I want to hear it, Jess. Um, they, claimed the they claimed that the road deaths for miles travelled mm. had fallen all the, all the way from the mid-1930s. That was the peak yeah. in their road deaths yeah. for miles travelled. Yeah. The interstate system had continuously over the years reduced, Fell. reduced, reduced yeah. the number of deaths and mm. fatalities. Yeah. In Milwaukee, we've an enormous, they have an enormous bridge uh, called the Home Bridge. Oh, yeah three lanes either side going over the Connecticut River and up into effectively what I would describe as the Shrewsbury Road area <laughs> of Milwaukee. Oh, very good, yeah, double four. It was destined to service the airport. Yeah. And it doesn't. <laughs> okay, right. So it, it, it literally terminates at Milwaukee it Four. Termin it terminates in yeah. a very scenic, very luxurious, very uh, up, uh, up market up area. Market to, to stop, stop it. it in yeah, and that's interesting because Interstate 95 has a missing section, I think, just north of Philadelphia. And the reason why was because uh, the Princeton residents, who obviously didn't have the political power of the, 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 the ordinary Joe Soaps in Seattle, they came out against the, pro the project, and obviously they were the politically powerful class in America. So there was a section of Interstate 95 which was never built at. Um, Princeton, and there was a kind of a there was a connection. I think Interstate 295 connects the two uh, ends of Interstate 95, just north of uh, Philadelphia. But the plan now is, and it's a current proposal, is to finally connect that uh, missing link of Interstate 95. And again, it was back to what uh, you were saying there about the politically powerful communities uh, able to use, I suppose, the courts and the legal mechanisms to, s to maybe stop stop sections of road uh, in their tracks. And, and another criticism of the Interstate was that uh, they were, were kind of the middle class's roads, but they were, they were run through the, the poor or the ethnic communities. They were all those communities that didn't have the political power to stop the roads. And they, they always felt that the middle classes were building the roads for their own convenience through the, the poor and the ethnic neighbourhoods, so um, th that's it. Although, uh, for some of the commentary I read, many of kind of people from ethnic groups, and I suppose, uh, would have seen the interstates as kind of, um, <coughs> they were kind of like corridors for opportunity. It, it enabled them to kind of, uh, maybe in terms of mobilising themselves to get to enter the economy or start a business and interstate, interstate open up those opportunities for maybe those poorer communities and the, the ethnic groups. You know. So good, very good point, yeah. It's, it's a common theme of the politically powerful stopping it, w stopping it in their own neighbourhood. The last one would be the yeah. sun life is very short. And oh, okay. It's demonstrated by the bridge collapse of I-35 in, in near Minneapolis. Yeah. That was about 10 years ago, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, and they said of that that it uh, fell, collapsed under the weight of engineering reports. Okay, you're very good, yeah, 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 and, and that's it. 
And you know, th this really comes back to a theme which, uh, which I, I spoke at the NRA TII conference in 2014 on the regional NES bypass, and, and it's a little hobby horse, which, which I, 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 it's not a hobby horse, but it's a point I suppose I keep making that we as uh, engineers, we do really have to communicate to people in society about what we do. It's amazing, I, I, I mean, I speak around Ireland in the colleges and the schools and, and libraries, but it's amazing how much people lo know so little about what we do, and yet a gr there's a great demand and interest to find out about what it is that we do. And I do think that by engineers being maybe more vocal and being more kind of forthright and saying, well, look, <coughs> if you don't invest in our infrastructure system, it's going to fall apart. If we keep on producing reports about bridges, the, 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 the reports will be sitting in the, 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 the filing cabinet while the, while the bridge columns are collapsing. So I do think we have a, a kind of a, an important role to play there in terms of public relations, uh, because it quite amazes me the level of interest from people in engineering they're just fascinated and sometimes when I, I go in giving a talk I'm talking about smart cities and stuff like that and sustain they stop me in my track and say Paul you don't need to just tell us what civil engineering is tell us what mechanical engineering is tell us what electrical engineering is and I mean we know what it is we, we you know we can rhyme it off the top of our heads but it's amazing the amount of people in society they see engineering but they, they want to explain to them and there's a great interest and I think there's a very broad I mean people talk about controversial road projects and they are, I suppose, if there's a direct impact. But I think there's a broad support out in society for what we're trying to achieve as engineers. And I, the one comment I get as a, as a roads engineer is that people say, I'm not against, who, particularly if they've been impacted, I'm not against progress, I'm not against the project, I can see why it has to happen, but I just want you to, to treat me right in terms of the way you deal with the impact on my property. So y the people support the project, they understand what we're trying to do. They obviously, like the environmentalists, they want it handled. They want their particular case handled in a certain way. And I think if, if we do listen to them and bring on board their comments, yeah, generally I think you, you, you'll always get a favourable resolution. I've certainly found, you know. But anyway. <laughs> yeah, very good, yeah, good man. Colin, is it? Colin, yeah, good man, Colin. No, no, no bother. Thanks, Colin. Yeah, yeah, well, it was the yeah, that's it. Yeah, it was the Federal Highways Commission uh, which which really uh, drove the the whole. It was originally the U.S. Bureau of Roads, uh, Bureau U.S. Bureau of Transportation. I might be saying that wrong. In the 1950s, and then it became the Federal Highways Commission, and they st I think they supplied nearly 80 or 90 percent of the funding for interstate highways because essentially that's what they were. They were they were kind of a federal highway system. In some cases, in some states, particularly that Virgin River Valley in Arizona. Um, th it, it actually wasn't really serving Arizona itself. It was going through the top northwest corner of Arizona. It was really serving Utah and um, uh, the state where Las Vegas is. Is that New Mexico? Nevada, yeah. Nevada and Arizona were the b or, uh, Nevada and Utah were the beneficiaries of the 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 I-15 uh, and and the other midwestern states. But it was going through. It was in Arizona. So the the uh, the kind of Ari the Ar Arizona authorities were kind of saying. Uh, you know, they were probably saying to the Federal Highways Authority, "You need to fund this road. It's really serving other states as opposed to us." But um, that's that was the mechanism, I suppose, column through which they, they delivered a bit like our own National Roads Authority. You needed a, really a national coordinating body to fund and to coordinate the delivery of 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 the road of the the, the road network. But. Um, yeah, you were asking me about the, the coordinate body, and in terms of funding, generally it was about an eight or ninety percent funding for interstate projects came from the federal authorities. I think they initially raised it through um, uh, it was a, um, a um, an increase in the amount of the petrol charge, and from that uh, the the charge on the the you know price per gallon of of petrol or diesel, uh, much of the funding for the interstate system came from that. An interesting point, actually, though, there was a delay on the funding of the interstates in the nineteen the late sixties and the nineteen seventies. 
and the reason why was and some of the projects were delayed it coincided with when America was involved in the Vietnam War and there was I mean I think they spent like a hundred billion on the Vietnam War so this that was a f that was obviously federal defense expenditure so this had an impact the money spent some one place there was less available for the roads so uh, that had an impact in terms of delaying interstate projects in the late 60s and 70s but by the mid 70s they were kind of back on course again so that by the mid 80s most of the interstate system was completed at that stage, but I suppose in terms of, of what uh, um, um, uh, the, uh, some of the others, other other um, um, people here were saying that um, th we're now looking at, I suppose, our the American authorities are certainly looking, the federal uh, highway authorities are looking at upgrading of the system, and I think uh, it's unfortunately maybe engineers weren't maybe as vocal as they co should have been. And now it's now the business community who is saying, look, we need efficient highways. We can't have a f highways which are falling apart, bridges collapsing and poor quality highways. And now it's the business community and the economists who are saying, would you, you know, you need to invest in the, the interstate system. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's like, it's like, and in terms of, uh, I think the, the figure for, in, uh, for upgrade of, of, of uh, kind of, uh, road networks is that I think you have to invest 2% per annum in your road network, 2% of the value of the road network to maintain it in a steady, steady state. So whatever the value of your, if your road network is 100 billion in value, well you have to be spending 2% of 100 billion, which is you know, 2 billion per annum, just to maintain that 100 billion value road network in a, in a steady state. So 2% per annum is the magic figure in terms of road maintenance, you know. So, uh, but I, I think maybe Mr. Trump might have, uh, might start developing. He's talking about jobs back home and stuff like that. So that's it. I think he'll have to start looking at the highway network. So I think he's he's, he's under big pressure. He's he's done a lot of talk and and I, I think now he's a huge he's a huge job in terms of delivery. So it'll be very interesting the next year or so to see what he's going to do. He's he certainly has. To, but the might, might what? Oh, exactly. In terms of highway construction, yeah. I mean, he's. I mean, just. I know this is a side point. I mean, he's talking about investment in transportation infrastructure and that links to this talk. But I think the big challenge in terms of science technology, he's talking about bringing the factories back to America for the blue collar workers. I think actually that's not the issue. I think the issue is actually the jobs have changed. Like the the, the manual labour of the 1980s, even maybe in construction and and the factories, they're maybe gone now. And I think he he has to look at upgrading the skills of the blue collar workers and then the factories will come back by themselves then I think the day of the manual unskilled workers probably disappearing in in advanced Western economies I think we're looking at what w I would call the semi skilled or the semi professional worker and it's upgrading their skills is the key issue the factories will come back by themselves then if this if they see thousands of skilled workers in Detroit or or, or, or Toledo or wherever the, fa the, the, the the multinationals will come back by themselves I think that's the key issue that, that they're going to have to deal with you know but I, that's sl slightly uh, deviating from uh, from the, the transportation issue but th thanks for that Colm um, yeah Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm actually, in terms of the modern stuff, I know historically uh, the concrete construction was the, was the standard pavement. Uh, the simple answer to that is I'm not too sure, um, but I, I can certainly find out. I have my email address on it, and I'll certainly look it up. And uh, it was an issue which I was thinking about. My understanding is that, that they still use uh, a lot of concrete construction, um, I think. But um, uh, in terms of the modern interstate systems, and, and maybe it's because they, ha they, they haven't been doing as many as much construction in the last 20 years although I think that's about to set to change it'll be interesting to see what they do utilize I suppose concrete construction would normally have a longer pavement design life than uh, bitumen uh, uh, pavement construction and I suppose we've traditionally used your bit bitumen pavement construction with with uh, pavement design life of you know 20 years but I, mean, I suppose concrete pavement design life would normally be kind of probably maybe longer than that. Although, as, as you're saying, Dermot, that maybe it, it, they didn't work last quite as long as they, they thought it would. No, they, they, they only designed it for 30 years. Oh, yeah, 30 years, yeah. Yeah. The, the yeah. Decks, the, the, yeah. There's a lot of concrete construction and a composite design yeah. with steel beams. That That's seem to be the paper, mm. bridges. Mm. Replacing them is an annual, annual event. Replacing. Very good, yeah, yeah. So yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. The uh, yeah. Section. Yeah. In Milwaukee, they spent a billion do dollars 
changing the Marquette interchange. Okay. The only change was that you didn't have to switch lane. Okay, right. Coming up to the junction, four freeways meeting at this yeah. Marquette interchange, that you would get into your lane, you got whichever way you okay. wanted to go. Yeah. It didn't matter. Uh, you just got in your lane. Okay. You didn't have to change lane. Okay. Well, I suppose the benefit of that is uh, any, anywhere you do have to change lane in terms of weaving from lane to lane, there's always going to be that danger of an accident. You're getting one a week or one a month or something tiny. Okay. Well, there you are. Well, okay. Well, I mean, I'd say that, that was a billion dollars maybe well spent, so. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. I'll leave that for you to decide, yeah. Any other questions, uh, gentlemen? What I want to do is that handout I've given you. That's what I would call a work in progress, as we engineers like to say. Uh, uh, I'm going to, it's, it, it, I had originally done this talk, it's 90% uh, of this talk is, the, uh, is, the, is uh, as per the original scri um, script, but I added in a few of those extra little summary pieces, and I'm going to incorporate them into that document. So if you want the, the, the upgraded version of that, if you email me in about a week's time, I'll have included all the extra little bits and pieces, because I had the original talk, uh, as I say, 90% of it is included here, but <coughs> what I did was in the last few days, I just, I ran through all the uh, the kind of the the, the interstate projects, <coughs> and I, I basically went look, looking for any other kind of interesting bits and and kind of interstate schemes which I added into the talk uh, yesterday. So I'll I'll, I'll integrate uh, th those extra um, interstate projects into that paper. And if you email me in about a week's time, I'll I'll, I'll I, if you want that uh, one, I'll send it on to you. Or if you want the pr uh, presentation itself, although it will be available on the on the podcast anyway. But I, I'll be upgrading that paper, and the the upgraded version will be available in about a week's time. So listen, thanks very much for coming. I'm delighted that you all came. I hope you found it interesting. And uh, I'll let you go. Thanks, thanks, folks. And thanks to those online. Thank you. Thanks to everybody online.